this panel discussion um, around the issue of what is the non-Hawaiian role in support of Native Hawaiian sovereignty. Okay, so, sorry, <laughs> the format of the discussion is going to be pretty, pretty simple. I'm just going to introduce our panel um, members, and then they will each have a chance to share you know, their personal opinion and experience with this issue, and then I'm going to leave time for questions and answers. So please think of some questions while you're listening, if possible. Um, so before we start, I really just want to thank, take the time to thank some people who helped me organize and start this panel. Um, I want to recognize, <coughs> I want to recognize and thank Professor Matsuda, who was actually the one who thought of this panel topic um, and encouraged me to pursue it, although I was nervous at first because I felt like it was potentially too sensitive. Um, she gave me names of people to talk to and books to read and articles to look up, and she took the time to listen to me, which I really appreciate. Um, I also want to thank my friends here that I met at the law school. inspirational to me, and I'm so proud to call them my friends. Um, my respect for them is what really started me thinking about and questioning my role and responsibility in Hawaii um, as a non-Hawaiian. And it's a big reason why I humbly and respectfully come here today to learn from everybody. Okay, so the panelists today are all highly respected individuals who so generously have dedicated their time to come and talk and answer questions. And again, I encourage everybody in the audience to take advantage of this opportunity. So, um, this is Professor John Osorio. <laughs> Famous professor. <laughs> 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 yeah, he's Jamaica's dad. <laughs> Professor Krieger, of course, and Mr. Haya, Moses Haya, and Professor Craig Howe. And so, um, with that, I, I left the introductions deliberately a little bit short because I just want them people to speak for themselves. But um, with that, I'll, 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 I guess, I guess let you go. <laughs> Would you like to start, Professor? Deeply grateful to the law school and to Eliza and to all of those who helped put this panel together. Um, I'm glad you said that you wanted something that was personal. Um, this is personal, but I did write it out, and that was just to make sure that I stay under the 10 minutes. Um, when I began doing the research on the early kingdom legislatures um, back as a, as a graduate student, I distinctly remember how I felt every time I ran into a holy name listed as a cabinet minister, member of the Privy Council, and increasingly after 1850, elected members of the legislature. Routinely, I wondered what sort of flim flammery they used to convince Kanaka voters to elect them. I wondered what they really wanted from their participation in our government. I wondered what wealthy and privileged offspring of theirs was still entrenched in Hawaii society 150 years later. To say that I approached my initial research as a biased observer would be a massive understatement. Had I not changed in the process of that research and writing my dis dissertation, I suspect that Dismembering Lahui would have been a lousy book. A terrible, maybe it was anyway. <laughs> a terribly, sh let me finish. <laughs> a terribly shallow and misleading history, very much perhaps as shallow and misleading as Thurston Twig Smith's Do the Facts Matter. But the change that occurred for me was not that I became more convinced, was not that I became more convinced that underneath it we are all the same, or that differences between Kanaka and non-Kanaka are the result solely of upbringing, education, culture, if you will. No, the longer that I labor in this field, 
teaching, speaking, reading, writing, singing, the more different I feel from Americans, the more alien and unsatisfactory their culture and behavior appear to me. Some of those differences, I believe, are written in our genetic codes and are the result of memories and behaviors that could very well be programmed into us at conception. I have come to the belief that it is, that it is our differences that attract people to one another, and that this happens far more often and more naturally between human beings than the tendency for the differences to repel us. Part of my own admittedly unscientific observations about ethnicity and politics are just my own personal involvement in all of this. My family has Portuguese, German, Chinese, and Hawaiian ancestors. My brothers and I have married Filipinos, American Haoles, Portuguese, and Hawaiian. My children and their children undoubtedly will sample from the incredible banquet of humanity that we are most fortunate to have in Hawaii. Which brings me to the problem that I have with the question of what role non-Hawaiians should play or seek to play in the, in, in the sovereignty movement. It raises for me the same alarms that I had reading William Richards discussing the need for finding foreign expertise to advise Koei Kiauli on the framing of a constitution, or Charles Reed Bishop whining about Gunalilo's unwillingness to sanction his proposal to exchange Pearl Harbor for a reciprocity treaty with the United States. I ask myself, why is this an important question? Considering the many different sorts of roles and, responsibility and, re and relationships that we all collectively need to navigate in life in Hawaii. What is, it, what is it that is especially important about sovereignty? I have to confess that my suspicion about Haole involvement in our kingdom's politics came from looking at politics as being purely about power. One looks at the careers of Jared Judd, William Little Lee, George Robertson, or Sanford Dole, and cannot miss the opportunism the accretion of personal power, influence, wealth. Look closer at their letters, speeches, and conversations, and you will find the signs of the 19th century American ethos. Their confidence in capitalism, their skepticism and ambivalence about Hawaiians, the conflicts between their religion and their sense of liberty, and increasingly, their weird and ugly ideas about race and capacity. And as we understand politics to be about power, we can certainly ask ourselves why we were so foolish to entrust such people with an ounce of it, and why would we be crazy enough to do so again? What I learned from writing Dismembering, and from living in a blended household, and from attending a predominantly white Lutheran church, is not some stupid lesson like how these can be trusted, but coming to an understanding about politics, namely that politics is not solely about power. It is also about justice and ethics and the projections of one's ideals. And while power is intimately and inseparably involved in the search for meaning in one's life, it seems to me that one should not prevent a human being from, being, from having the power to advocate for him or herself. One should not remove the power of speech or creative expression from a human being trying to define him or herself. One should not deny a human being the dignity of acting ethically and morally to defend a cause. Sovereignty, and I know this deep in my gut to be true, is not just about the restoration of Hawaiian political power and control of our resources. It is also about restorative justice on the struggle for integrity and decency and the human need for kindness. This would be about the time when I would use the A word. That's aloha, yeah. <laughs> if you're going to say something true as a Hawaiian, you have to use that word at some point. When someone who is not Hawaiian seeks to find themselves some sense of meaning for themselves in a movement that at least up until now has demanded more sacrifice than it is offered material reward, can we not afford to be less suspicious of their motives? Let me put it another way. 
If sovereignty were purely an end, a goal, a target of some kind, we would know what it looked like. We would have framed already what that nation would be in our own minds. And I suspect we would already have decided what place non-Hawaiians should have within it. But sovereignty isn't just an end. It is a journey. It is the day-by-day -day choices that we make. Sovereignty is how we live and think, how we teach and how we relate to others. I long ago ceased to be an American in the ways I think of myself, in what I value, and especially in how I relate to other people. And at least for me, it is those relationships that I value. And more than the examples of my own life, I think the movement would be pure, poorer without the non-Hawaiians who give, gave so much of their lives to pursue restorative justice, to protect cultural practices, to learn and teach our language, to mentor our students, to heal Kaho'olawe, and to protect the native forest. Such people are all around us. We have worked with them. We have found them to be reliable and trustworthy, trustworthy friends and compatriots, and we have learned from them as well. For myself, I have found that these relationships are the very thing that brings me to a deeper understanding of the struggle for sovereignty. This is about acknowledging and, and dignifying our own identities as Kanaka, as local, and yes, even as American. In the struggle to continue to distinguish ourselves as Kanaka, we cannot avoid the realization that with regard to Americans, we are outnumbered, outgunned, and outfinanced. And we have more to regret the seduction of our own young to American culture and its presumption than the appearance of non-Kanaka who wish to throw their lot in with us. I believe that sovereignty is upon us. I believe that we are succeeding. But as our movement accrues the political authority and economic power that comes with governing, we are required to ask increasingly tougher questions of those who present themselves as leaders. And here I speak not only to non-Kanaka, but to the Kanaka who wish to be leaders. We must determine for ourselves where the loyalties of our leaders and comrades lie. And if we are not willing to ask the sticky, icky questions of Kanaka, non-Kanaka, friends, family, and even ourselves, then we need to ask ourselves whether we should be involved in power politics at all. Here are some of the questions. What are your intentions? To whom or what are you committed? What are you prepared to sacrifice? The simple truth is this. The higher the political stakes, the more critical the questions, and our answers to those questions become. Leadership is not for the faint of heart. It bangs you up. And hopefully the exposure to criticism and skepticism makes us more self-aware of our personal stakes and more aware of the consequences of the actions we take as leaders. If this were merely a question of identity, a search for meaning, if this were merely a question of, of offering people a place in the community, then my belief is that we should all be as merciful as we possibly can. When it comes to leadership, you ask the tough questions, and you expect the leaders to ask it of themselves as well. Thank you very much. As always, I have the. Can you hear me? I yeah. okay. As always, I have the unenviable task of following John Osorio, <laughs> except when we're running. <laughs> Um, Eliza asked us to approach this personally. Um, I'm going to just make a, a sort of a few points along the way. Um, but one of the things I'm not going to do for a couple of reasons is, in some ways, provide a kind of biography over the 33 autobiography over the 33 years that I've, I've been in Hawaii since 1980, um, because 
any gesture in that direction in some way starts turning it either intentionally or non-intentionally into whether I can show, uh, tell a story that shows I'm a good hobby. Right. <laughs> um, and I don't think that's the subject, and in fact I think that's one of the things that tends to derail what we're actually talking about and engaging with here. Um, the second thing I want to, so uh, I'm going to talk on topic, but not so much in relation to whether I fit whatever bill we're talking about. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention is, uh, John's a historian, I'm very interested in it as well, is that this kind of discussion isn't something that's just started recently. It's a continual discussion, and it's one that runs over the entire period of time. Uh, it's a question the missionaries were asking, you know, how do we do good, how do we do well? There are a wide range of answers, and they were astoundingly fraught. Um, I had a colleague in my department a number of years ago who came in, who's uh, a very strongly uh, activist faculty member and was looking to situate herself in this community and understand what was going on. And one of the things when we were talking about this was I just mentioned that one of the things history shows us is whatever configuration we decide would be the ethical and appropriate and politically astute position to occupy, particularly if uh, um, uh, a holly or a settler of, of some kind, whatever that position is and whatever level of integrity you bring to it, 20 to 25 years later and beyond, we'll be able to look back and explain exactly how that's not what should have been happening. <laughs> okay. So this is a question that's in flux, that is always in a kind of movement, and we're <coughs> all going to look uh, uh, blind in various ways when we get to look back at ourselves in a few years. I know I could do that just looking back at myself in the 80s and the 90s. The other thing I was just going to mention in terms of the panel, and this is one of these things that's moved, um, the discussion often can get moved to a kind of uh, how resources Hawaiians, and I was delighted that those were the names that John brought up primarily in his earlier discussion. But if you look particularly at what's been going on in discussing these kind of issues over the last 10 or 15 years, one of the hot spots has been the issue of settler colonialism. And engaging the issue to what degree do those communities who came in here through immigration and are not Haole, but have been here for many generations and whatever, what is their relation as non-Hawaiians to the Hawaiian sovereignty movement? And if you know the work of Fujikani and Okamura and the very strong responses that have come back to that community, you'll realize that that is another dimension of this discussion, which at least isn't represented up here, and I hope is in some ways represented uh, when we're uh, in the discussion. Um, I had two things that uh, I essentially wanted to bring up. Uh, the easy answer here is the one that David Standard has been supplying for a long time. When asked what is the role of non-Hawaiians in the sovereignty movement, he would say, not in the front, not behind, at the side. Next question. Moses, it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. The question is, what does that mean and under what circumstances? All right. Um, I have two things I'd like to sort of point to here. One is actually uh, some theory work on by the, the activist and survivor of the repressive regimes, a torture survivor of the repressive regimes of Argentina, Alicia Portnoff, who's visited here a, a number of times. And she's talked specifically about, in terms of a academia and more broadly, basically, what is the role of the people who are actually dealing with these issues on the ground when academics and lawyers and other people start talking about them? And she advocates a model that showed up in an article we published in the journal Biography, which she referred to as co-labor action. So one of the answers would be is, because many of us are in sort of positions of power through teaching or through participation in very community mode, whenever that subject comes up, the first thing should be the role, the primary role of the non-Hawaiian in the sovereignty movement should be Whenever it comes up that you're in a situation talking about, you should try and make sure that Hawaiians are there as part of the conversation as well. All right. And that movement of foregrounding and recognizing that there's a kind of collaborative mode involved in here. And that you know, the articulation of your opinions always have to be in relation to discussing with other people and acknowledging the position which is actually more central to what's going on. So I think one of the things for me always has been a notion of peripheral. Now, not a notion of peripheral in the sense of, this is none of my business, I'm going to stay out of there. All right. 
some very well-intentioned people have very elaborate arguments as to why they by ethically should have no position on the sovereignty <coughs> movement because they would not presume to have an opinion on such a thing, which you can see that there's a kind of doubleness uh, to that. Um, so in terms of just pragmatically, when we were talking, when John and I were putting together the book, The Value of Hawaii, and there's three other contributors, at least in, in the room here, um, in writing the introduction, uh, one of the things that I was addressing, because we did make a strong attempt to make sure that there was a very strong Kanakamali presence in here uh, throughout the entire book, was to say, okay, what kind of position, as somebody who is not directly involved as a Hawaiian within the sovereignty movement, what kind of positions are most viable for people to be able to hold, and what can they do? And this came up very quickly afterwards. Uh, the first thing I said in the introduction, which was fairly easy, was that, that basically nothing can happen in Hawaii, regardless of whether you're engaged with a, a notion of sovereignty or not. Nothing can move Hawaii forward until those issues are engaged with fully. As long as we're in the perpetual situation of delay and waiting as to whether issues of water, of reparations, of actual ownership or stewardship of land, as long as those have been delayed and continue to be delayed, as long as they have judicially, legislatively, personally, we are always going to be in a situation where we have to have these kinds of discussions. So I think one of the roles is for people who are not uh, non-Hawaiians within, within the sovereignty movement is, in, is to insist to other non-Hawaiians that this issue has to be taken seriously and it has to be something that is direct, directly and acted upon, not continued to go in the kind of drift. Right? Now, the second thing came up, right after this came out, the Star Advertiser asked John and I to do a couple of editorials. And <laughs> the task that they set, to suggest something about their own sense of their readership, was they said, we want you to write an essay in which you explain to people who are totally opposed to sovereignty and want nothing to do with any kind of Hawaiian movement why they have to pay attention to this. <laughs> that was the question. <laughs> All right. um, what I ended up writing was something along the lines of what was in the introduction, but it seems to me this was a place where I felt I could be, in some ways, engaged in the so sovereignty movement in being able to say, or one of the reasons is, regardless of what your position on this is, the fact that we are basically hanging, the fact that this is in a situation of drift, all right, that there is no kind of engagement as to where things need to move, basically puts all of us in a situation of anxiety, unease, and in some ways fundamental bad faith with the place we live and the people that we live with. So even if what you're hoping for out of all of this is an utter destruction and defeat of all sovereignty issues, that would actually be better for you to work for than to have it continue the way it's going now. Right? So just in summing up here, it seems to me um, the issue of the role of the non-Hawaiian in the sovereignty movement runs the gamut of every single person you define as non-Hawaiian. Uh, for me, and I'll be a bit biographical here now, I would like to feel that my commitment to this place is stronger than anywhere else and to its future is more important than anything else, including the United States, including elsewhere, and that's the way I would like to live here. All right? But, back to Partnoy's notion of collabor action, that is not something I can just decide is my position, and many non-Hawaiians, and particularly Hawaiians, are very good at deciding, in fact, what would be the appropriate position, and then informing other people about it. Uh, not out in front, not behind, at the side. Uh, so it seems to me that with knowledge, with understanding, with communicating with other people, people who want to find their place, all right, will be able to find, and in some ways ask permission by their actions, not just coming and ask permission, can I hang out? But by their actions, in some ways, asking permission to be taken seriously and to be seen as useful in a movement that I think all of us have to want to move forward. So I'll just stop there. Aloha. 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 I, first of all, want to thank you, Eliza, for um, providing this opportunity and for everyone out there who 
I know um, could probably be doing something else right now. I appreciate you know, the fact that you're showing an interest in that. Um, that's, I think, the first step to anything. Right? Um, <clears throat> just to let you know, for me um, to try to say why I believe it's important for everyone who has a stake in Hawaii, who lives in Hawaii, uh, to be concerned about sovereignty is the best way for me to do that is, tell, is to tell you about me. I know that's vain, but that's, that's how I see um, my way of coming to the point of me being who I am today as a Hawaiian. And that starts out a fairly long time ago um, in an area that was predominantly um, a neighborhood of military, um, close to the bases, uh, Hickam and Pearl Harbor. And as, you know, I'm Hawaiian, Chinese, Portuguese, Greek, um, but the majority of the population there were Caucasian, Hawaii. So my best friends uh, growing up in the area are Hawaii. And most of them are military dependents. And they have these privileges as military dependents that I don't. And I am immediately um, realizing that I'm different. And um, they're still my really good friends, but there's a difference. And it, and it becomes um, something that starts to be um, acknowledged and, and, and verified in other aspects of my life. As I'm going to school, um, I go to the school for all Hawaiian children, and in that school I, I'm learning that you know, while my ancestors were very intelligent, um, you know, industrious people, um, that was back then. Today is a different time. And if I want to be a productive member of society, I'm going to have to learn how to do things uh, in a, a more American way. And there's, and let me just say this though. For me, as a victim of my own perspective, right? <laughs> so <clears throat> I, I am also being shown the, the evidence for, for why I need to do this is that if I don't, Hawaiians are number one in almost everything you don't want to be number one in, in uh, prison, uh, in welfare, you know, everything that you don't want to be number one in, I'm being told that's, what, that's what's in store for me if I don't move on. And once again, I am, this is my perspective of what I'm seeing. So on a surface level, that is, you know, something that I'm dealing with. I, I now today realize that uh, on a very... Uh, on a deeper level, um, I struggled with that big time because how could that be? But as a result of that, I end up um, just getting in trouble all the time. Uh, and ultimately getting to the point where there aren't very many options for me anymore. It's prison. Uh, you know, so I, I am actually... I am becoming the person that uh, people were saying I was going to become if I didn't do what I needed you know, to do to, to be more American. So ultimately what happens to me is I go through treatment for drug addiction. And um, in that process, I'm sitting in a meeting, and this Hawaiian older Hawaiian gentleman is sharing in that meeting and all I remember him saying was I'm proud to be Hawaiian and how, 
how is that? Um, so after the meeting, I go up and I talk to him, and, and he says to me, I say, well, you know, I'm interested in, in what you meant by that you're proud to be a Hawaiian. And he just looks at me and kind of smiles and, and says, you know what, just hang around and, you know, see what's happening. But that was the point at which I started on the journey of finding out what it was for me, what it was for me to be a Hawaiian. Um, previous to that, it was I was almost apologetic for it because I believed I was, you know, less than. Um, so I start on this journey, and I start to realize that a lot of what I was being fed, um, once again, a victim of my own perspective, but the stuff was out there for me to perceive, um, <coughs> that I became like I said, apologetic for being Hawaiian. You know, where there were times when, you know, in the in the early 70s where, you know, Kaho'olawe and uh, Kalama Valley and, and, and Hawaiians were, were standing up and speaking out, and I was embarrassed about that. I, I felt like they were an embarrassment to me. Um, so that's, that's where I come from. That's, and I believe, is the result of my not being able to find out who I am as a Hawaiian as early as possible. To have a foundation in that as early as possible. Um, and, and that's why I believe that we all have a stake in this. I don't want that happening anymore. I don't want that to be one of the consequences of living in Hawaii. There needs to be an ability for a Hawaiian child, whoever it is, to be proud of that a ancestry, of you know, that sense of being, of, of, of uh, you know, and I think stuff has, has uh, started to happen already. And is it, you know, it, we're, we're pretty much um, dealing with that. But there are still, you know, it's crazy for me. One of, the, one of my examples is that when the Olympics rolls around, um, you know, I'm just already conditioned to root for the United States. Why, why is that? Um, so I have a sense that. There are a few law students here. <laughs> um, you know, the work I do is how I myself um, assert my personal sovereignty as a Hawaiian. I I endeavor to 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 make the Hawaii, the world, a place where no one has to deal with what happened to me. No one has to ever um, be ashamed of being Hawaiian. They have to, to think about why, you know, I was dealt this hand and stuff like that. Because, I mean, it's just, it's just not, it's not right. Um, so, as law students, and I, I want to say I'm a proud alumna. <laughs> William S. Richardson School of Law. But as law students, um, I think there, are, if, if you buy into what we're talking about, there's an obligation on your part to look at the type of work that you plan to do and to look at, at it deeply and seriously and determine whether or not there is an ability for you to ensure that what you do as an attorney is not counterproductive to sovereignty, to, to allowing a Hawaiian child to, to have the opportunity to uh, have a, a really early foundation on what it is to be Hawaiian. And, and so that's where, that's where I come from. Yeah, mahalo.
find myself in a this on I find myself in this funny position sitting up here because um, more than anything, what I have learned in the now seven years since I moved back home. I grew up here and then lived for many years on the mainland. Um, is that the most important thing I can do um, to be faithful to what has always felt to me like my homeland and um, the people with whom I have thrown in a lot of my life, which is not just Hawaiian people, but people of Hawaii. What I can most valuably do is to stop talking. Um, so it's really weird for me to sit up here finding myself talking. Um, Rather, I have learned that um, when my mouth is open, my ears are closed, or closed-ish. And not just my ears, but the rest of my senses. That I learn more when I'm quiet. I learn more even when I don't ask questions, but just watch what is happening and feel what is happening and train. Um, I don't have another word for it than na'al, because there's not really another, there's not really a, an English word for it. To train that part of me to ju to experience what is what is real and what is just and what is right for me to, to do. And and so I don't have. I mean, I'm usually a person who has all kinds of words and all kinds of theories and all kinds of things. But when I talk about this one, or when I think about this one issue. What can or what should uh, non Hawaiians do to support Native Hawaiian sovereignty? I find myself feeling quite at a loss for words. Um, if I try to find some words, they would be first of all, do not expect to lead anything. You know, that, I mean, people who are political activists, and I have my whole life been a political activist, we tend to jump out in front, to raise our hands, to want to say something, to want to start something. But in this situation, my feeling is, no, that's not appropriate. Um, one needs to watch, one needs to listen, one needs to wait to be invited, asked to do something, and it's usually something specific. Um, and then one does that something specific with aloha, with graciousness, with competence, with care, uh, and after then that work is done, one steps back and becomes quiet again and learns more by observing, by being in the proximity of something that you don't understand. Um, I, when I was younger, I thought I understood a lot more about Hawaiians, Hawaiian-ness, Hawaiian culture than now, I think. I, I, I am aware now that I know nothing or you know, very, very little, and that the way to, to be part, to really be part of this place that I love so much is to just be a learner, be a beginner, uh, be quiet. Um, but, you know, when you're faced with specific choices, uh, who to vote for, what to spend your time on, so on and so forth, how to spend whatever political capital you might have in a situation, you know, just saying be quiet and don't 
you know, skin. That, that doesn't do it. That doesn't cut it, right? It, you have to have some principles by which to make decisions uh, in most places, in those, fa in those situations. And I'm finding, um, as I feel my way forward, um, that the following, um, the following principles help me make those decisions. Uh, one is, um, in, any, in any situation where there is uh, an allocation of resources that has to be made, um, make sure that resources are being allocated in a way that um, empowers Hawaiians to create Hawaiian spaces. So prioritize creating decolonized Hawaiian spaces. Um, so, for me, my role in that is almost like the role of um, a defensive, I, I must be ete season or something, <laughs> um, a, a defensive line person whose job is to create an empty space in back of the line where the offensive workers can do their thing. So they can, without obstacle, move the ball down the field. However they decide is the best way to move it, right? Um, so I find myself more and more playing a lot of defense in terms of just keeping spaces open and keeping um, trying to make sure that the resources go in that direction rather than in some other direction. But not expecting to make the decisions about how those resources get spent. Right? So that's, that's one, one thing. <coughs> um, and, and actually, if, if, if I can just do those two things and help other um, non-Hawaiians learn the value of and the techniques for doing those two things, I'll die a happy person. <laughs> right? Because I think those are very, very valuable, those are really valuable contributions. Um, and if I am able to do that, I'll be, I'll be happy. Second thing um, that guides me is an experience I had, and this may sound a little uh, a cult or something. I don't know. Um, and that is to, the, the principle is to learn to hear and accept when the answer is no. So when I first came here, um, the school uh, did a because my predecessor, um, as director of the pre-admission program, now the Ululehu program, had died an untimely death that had really torn this community asunder and had really harmed the community and people were um, spiritually uh, hurting <laughs> as a result of that tragedy. And as one way of trying to heal that, uh, the community did a blessing ritual for the sort of the, not my arrival exactly, but having a permanent Lehua director come. And um, as part of that, we planted a Lehua, uh, an Ohia Lehua tree in the courtyard. And um, I was told uh, in a couple of days, a couple of days before that happened, that as one of the um, Kupuna women in the community, which really freaked me out. <laughs> what? Um, that it would be my role to help dig the hole uh, for the tree, and then also to put the first water on the tree. And that the water that would be used for the tree 
needed to be collected um, in an ipuvai from a flowing stream in Manoa, and then it would need to be uh, soaked in kukui leaves overnight. So I needed the day before this ritual to go up into the valley and to find, and I wasn't supposed to go like to a stream that I, I like not over, you know, just a Manoa stream. And I, was, I was supposed to go up into the valley and find this water. So I, I um, took this Ipubai, I went up into East Manoa and I found uh, part of Manoa stream up, up high in East Manoa. And, and I was taught uh, by the, the uh, Kumu who was setting up the uh, ritual, this, uh, this permission, this only a permission to ask to copiate and collect water. And so I stood there and I did this and waited. And I heard this very, very clear answer. No. No, you can't have my water. I don't know you. Um, no. <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, and so I cried, and um, I thought, and then it occurred to me, well, okay, I know about Manoa Stream, but I know from my childhood that there's a stream in West Manoa. <laughs> um, I don't know where it is, um, but I'm, I'm just going to go look for it. Right? So I went up and I'm, I went into the botanical garden, uh, to Lion Arboretum, in the back of the valley, and I just started walking. And um, I walked and walked and walked, and I wasn't finding anything, and I was starting to cry again, and I was thinking, oh God, if I, don't, if I can't find any water, that means I don't belong here, it means I don't, shouldn't take this job, and now what am I going to do, right? So I'm walking along, feeling very sorry for myself. <laughs> And um, all of a sudden, to the right of me, there's this uh, guava tree, and bloop, this guava plops to the ground. And okay, I'll admit it. When I was a high school student, I used to go up to um, up up there, and you know. <laughs> on the video, it's just a fluke. <laughs> so, and, and boy, at those, t at those moments, guavas tasted really <laughs> I know they're invasive, and they are the, they will, but boy, they taste good. So, I noticed this guava, and, and so I, um, I looked down, and I picked it up, and I ate it, right? And as I was eating the guava, I noticed this little pathway going off. So I walked down this pathway, and I, I walked and I walked and I walked, and there at the end of the pathway was a stream, and so I was able to collect this water and bring it back. And you know, I, I have to tell you, I don't have answers to these questions. I don't know what my my personal role is, or will be, or should be, and I'm sure that there's lots of people who would tell me that my role is to get on the next plane and get out of here. But you know what? I don't believe that. In, in my na'al, I don't believe that. I, this is my home. And this is my country. Um, if I'm allowed, if I'm invited, but you have to be invited. You know, you don't, you, I'm very, very aware that I will never, and none of us should ever think we have the land, or we have the ocean. That if we're lucky, the land has us. The ocean has us. And we're here to serve it. So, these are just some, I realize this is kind of all over the place, but I, I don't have, I don't have answers to these questions. I don't think any of us have answers to these questions. Um, well, we have so many, so many answers to our questions that it doesn't help much. 
Um, but to those of you in the room who are looking for answers, I, I mean, the advice I can give is, if you want my advice, is stop talking and just listen and see. Um, you kind of mentioned it before, you know, I spent the last year, especially various kinds of actions, documenting demonstrations, protests, a lot of them intersecting or involving Hawaiian sovereignty kind of issues. And, uh, you know, it seems to me, and I'm looking around the room just to get a view of the demographics, um, it seems to me I'm Japanese, and I, I always feel kind of self-conscious because I don't see my guys. Uh, you know, these things. A lot of Hawaiians on, on all kinds of stuff where it deals with water or like at the GMO hearing yesterday at the city council. Um, but at these things on the street anywhere, I don't see a lot of um, Asians. I don't see Japanese people. And I was wondering if you had some insight on, on why that might be or anyone else might have some insight on that. There is a <clears throat> there's an attorney that works in the office that uh, that I run. His name's Alan Murakami, and uh, you know he's not Hawaiian, but his his advocacy on behalf of Hawaiians and, and Hawaiian rights is second to none. Um, you know we have another Wahine in our office. He's Japanese and. She's, you know, basically the same way. She's, she doesn't like me to call her this, but she's the de deputy director. She's the real boss. But, you know, same way. I mean, these these two people, and I'm sure there's others, um, it's clear in, in my mind that they get it. Yeah. I've, I've known quite a few um, people of Japanese ancestry who have been involved in the movement. Um, and at Mente a long time ago, uh, Kosasa, um, Aiko Yamashiro, who is um, one of the principal editors in, um, of Value of Hawaii, you know, and, and, a, and, a good, and a good friend. And, and again, I think that the questions that they ask themselves is, you know, just how upfront they should be and what their position about it should be. And I think it's an extraordinary sensitivity uh, that they feel when they become politically involved. Um, you know, it's. I think it's important for people to begin to, to to make some determinations of themselves about where they stand in this movement, because you know, in order to 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 bring the nation about again, we really do. <coughs> need to have the participation and the commitment of the people who live here and who are committed to something beyond simply making a living for themselves. And I, I, I do think that um, if, if people are, are, are waiting for a sign um, that, that their commitment is needed, um, then you're just not looking hard enough. Um, Signs are, signs are everywhere. When, when people start talking about independence, independence as opposed to federal recognition or as opposed to nation within a nation, they, we are specifically talking about an, a country independent of the United States. And, and most of us, certainly I do, hearken back to the laws of the kingdom that allowed people to become voters and to participate as members of, of the Hawaiian nation um, by declaring themselves. So, you know, at some point it starts, it, it, it needs some kind of declaration. Some, remember that question I, to what are you committed? To what are you committed? 
I don't think, I don't, I don't think that um, the Japanese are keeping themselves away necessarily because they're more American than Chinese or or Portuguese or Filipinos. I think it's just a question of um, all of us being either um, overly sensitive about our commitment to this or not ready to commit. I hope that's clear. <laughs> I think just briefly on that, I mean, if you go back, John was sort of alluding to this. Um, if you go back to Bayonet Constitution, there was a deliberate attempt to try and make sure that people of Asian ancestry would never have a significant role in Hawaii ever. Right? And so that as a result, not surprisingly, given the demographics and the percentage of the population, every way possible to try and ref refute that loaded deck has essentially been, a, you know, that's been the history of 20th century Hawaii, and the post-territory Hawaii. Um, for me, it seems to me, if we're talking about the issue of sovereignty, and this is something I thought a lot about when we were doing a lot of the events in terms of um, value of Hawaii and various other things, the real issue, and it was the issue that came up in the 19th century as well, is whether you're living here and actually are committed to a notion of Hawaii first. And I think that there's a sizable portion of the population who would not be able to invest with that, whether it's uh, America first or, or something else. But I think that in, in essence, I mean, in that kind of larger community that John's talking about, it's that issue of that kind of commitment. And, and I think when people do make that kind of commitment, then they tend to show up because there's a sort of direction for that. If that is not the commitment that they can make, then it's a matter of it's business as usual. And I think even within the sustainability movement and various other things, to say that we want a situation where we're growing more of our own food and we <coughs> basically survive for longer than two weeks if we have to be on our own, it seems to me that's a Hawaii first argument even by people who might not necessarily buy into a sovereignty movement. They are behind. So that's the way I, I, I sort of look at it. And it seems to me, in terms of that notion of Hawaii first, you see a whole range across the spectrum of every race and ethnicity here. But there's lots of people who would not make that statement. Yeah, in the back. Hi, um, I'm Marshall Lee, um, and I'm wondering if um, well, as, as a Marshallese and from the Micronesian community, there's been a lot of tension between the uh, Native Hawaiians and this new influx of uh, immigrants. And I know that that has a lot to do with the compact impact, and you know, there's a lot of talk about how Micronesians are taking away welfare or you know, um, hospital beds and those kinds of situations. And you know, I just wanted to ask you, you folks, um, because there's, a, there's so many times that I've spoken to other clients, and I support the sovereignty movement, but, you know, I don't know what to respond when they say, why don't you just leave our land then and go back to where you came from? And Good those question. Kind of things, which is very hurtful for me because I feel that our struggles are so actually very similar. And so I just wanted to see if maybe you can speak on that. Like, uh, yeah, I just wanted to hear your thoughts. Don't you think it's crazy that Micronesians and poor Hawaiians should be fighting over those kinds of scraps? Um, don't you think it's insane? Um, the fact of the matter is, is that the argument that we all have is with this government. It's with the unequal distribution, I mean not just unequal, grossly unequal distribution of, of, of resources and wealth that has been a part of this islands, of these islands' history for a very, very, very long time. This is the struggle we're all involved in. Um, there's, also, there's also ignorance, but I, I, I tell you honestly, um, the fight should not be among the poorest of us. You know, the fight should be with the government, with the United States, um, with the tremendous uh, amount of our lands that they use for military bases that they simply took. So, um, and and by the way, you also have a huge, huge fight with the United States over what they did to your lands. And, in, and on this, every Hawaiian should be in complete solidarity with 
with people from the martial arts. Complete and total solitary. back here in late 92 after 15 years away. Um, the organization Kalahui was in its ascendancy and so was the sovereignty movement. Um, we, they had the march in early 93 to mark the overthrow. And it seemed to me there was a distinct uh, difference in what sovereignty would mean between, say, Kalahui and some people like the Cooney Blaisdell advocating for complete independence. Now I tend to hear a lot more people in the Hawaiian activist community the discourse is about complete independence. So I was going to ask you, is that, I know there's not a consensus, but is that an accurate character, characterization of where the community is going now? And what led them to move in that direction? I believe that, <coughs> that that's accurate. I believe that more and more um, more and more Kanaka who are involved in sovereignty are moving toward independence. But that's not to say that that's what we're going to get. I, I, I do think that there are far more people who support it, far more people who see this as logical and sensible, and, and really the only thing that you can, that you can actually rationally um, um, create if you are going to be faithful to law. Um, the second part of that question that you asked, though, what, how, how was it that people decided to move in that direction when they didn't share that vision? Because it's rational. Because, <laughs> because we learned more and more about the actual circumstances of the kingdom and, and, and the um, unseating of the queen and um, the, the so-called um, you know, annexation. It, it's, it's just rational. I mean, if, and then we're thinking people. So when you look at something that looks stupid, um, you think, okay, that's stupid, so what's the truth? I, I think that's why. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, um, I wanted to thank you, thank you all for sharing, and, and um, thank the organizers of this panel. There's a couple points that I appreciated, and then I want to um, kind of speak to a little bit. Um, one is that Professor Osorio talked about issues of national identity. And Professor Hollow, you talked about um, looking at the relationship of settler colonialism to the sovereignty movement here. And for me, these are the kinds of positionalities that I think are more helpful um, when, when considering what is the role of non -science. Um Uncle Doug had talked about why aren't there more Japanese you know, on the streets and things like that. So I think one of the things one of the issues that we, we have to talk about is um, the need for a critical mass um, to reach our goals and to keep the balance of power in order for independence to be achieved. And so, um, this also speaks to Cass Yeah, to, I think what you're saying, I'm going to try to. When, um, okay, wait, i got to read it real quick. Okay, so I'm, I'm also a TA for Professor Osorio's 107 class, and it's 280 students in one class. They watch all kinds of videos throughout the semester, and they, they write reaction papers. So in my section, there's students in the military, most of them are American identifying, and when they watch things like um, Half-Life, for example, or videos on Kaho Olave, their reaction papers are just saturated with guilt and shame. And so, how do I address that, right? Um, one of the ways that I address that with them is by talking to them about um, legacies of resistance in the United States that come from American citizens. So that they can join in and perpetuate that legacy by holding their own governments responsible. So, for me, um, what I feel is important for non hawaiians to do is to identify as American citizens and to hold their government responsible and their people, their fellow citizens, help bring them to consciousness. I also feel like us as Kanaka Maui, when we're talking about leadership, we need to be working harder to bring our own people to consciousness as well. So that's creating movement and things like that. So for me, that, those kinds of things are a little bit more helpful than 
then um, although I really appreciate the politics of positionality and interpersonal spaces and, and career spaces and academic spaces and things like that, when we're talking about roles, you know, I think we really need to be pushing um, for more critical consciousness in our community in relation to each other, rather than saying, well, you know, I, I don't really identify as American because I don't really like what they do. Well, you're American, so, you know, start, you know, perpetuating that legacy. And, and, um, and I appreciate the way in which, you know, all of the panelists do that. But you're talking about those larger relationships and how we do position ourselves and say, yes, you know, for those of, for people who do consider themselves American, yes, I am American, and this is my kuleana to hold my government accountable. That's how we can start making connections um, on the political level uh, when, we're, when we're trying to address issues of militarism in Hawaii, which is what is the entity that um, impedes on our sovereignty more than anything else. It's that which defines our relationship with the U.S. So there needs to be movement building, consciousness <coughs> raising within our own community. Sorry, no questions. A lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Do you guys have any responses? Um, I selected her as a TA. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I think in response to that as well, um, in response to the question about Asian Americans, Asians being in um, this fight or this call, perhaps it's also because there isn't, I'm not sure if there's an invitation to other people in the community to come and join in the fight, yes, there are issues, there are political issues that we can all identify with in one degree or another, but maybe particularly with the Asian community, maybe they need an invitation. I mean, my grandma won't even go to a Thanksgiving dinner if she didn't hear you say, I'm inviting you to come. And, and maybe there's that element of, of really calling the community and saying, we're inviting you to come. And I, I feel like they would come because I grew up here. This is the only home I know. I've been away, and I felt like a total stranger on the mainland. So I, Hawaii is the only home I know, and the Hawaiian culture is, a lot of the times I feel like it's mine as well. But maybe for the rest of the Asian community, there isn't that. I just want to raise I, I want to raise the issue of um, globalization because I think in some ways things are getting so much more complicated than they even were before. And they, they've been complicated all along, but now it seems like they're even more complicated because, um, you know, there are, there are so many of the world's wealthy um, coming now to Hawaii. Um, and it, although that's, you know, it's, it's, it's not a difference in, in kind necessarily from what's been happening for a couple hundred years, but it just feels like the pace of it and the, the disparities involved have ramped up so much that the, I'm afraid I don't really know exactly what it is I'm trying to, to say, but I would like to hear what people's thoughts are about the, cons the, the moment in time in which we find ourselves now with so much money coming in from outside. I mean, somebody just bought Lanai. I mean, not that Lanai hasn't been bought before, but there's, you know, there's this, what do we do about that? Uh, 26 years ago, in Mansa, 
bathroom over. Uh, the Ahabui uh, for this lawsuit had a very intense and bitter battle over the issue of whether non Hawaiians were going to be allowed into the Hui. 26 years ago. And it almost came to full on beef. I mean, full on troll down what? <laughs> Hey, I'm a Huya Rabi. <laughs> God so personally vicious over the issue of what is the role of non Hawaiians in, in Hawaiian sovereignty, movements, place, you name it. Yeah, that's 26 years ago. Fast forward, I come to this event, oh, okay, it's interesting to talk about. You know, for me, the issue really becomes if the legacy of Richardson is about justice in Hawaii. And this lawsuit is producing attorneys to further that trajectory of justice. Then what does it mean for those who are getting an education at Richardson School of Law to do that? And I say to my classmates, same thing I say to these young people today. What is the intention, commitment, sacrifice? Okay, so even if you go to the top firms, whatever they are today, in Alamos, Arn, Brazil, I don't know, Keisha, I don't know what's out there. <laughs> okay. I say to them, even if you are in top firms, even if you're in nonprofits, even if you are in fair justice, there's always a role for attorney to do justice. So if it's pro bono hours, if it's what you do on your days off, if it's part of critical mass, okay? It has to begin with you in your daily practice. That's the bottom line as far as roles and kuleana. And let's talk about kue, the resistance. How are we going to get to critical now? If in this place of higher education and the dialogue, which we very little have, okay, if not here, then where? Because you tell me where in the community we having this kind of discussion. Well, we're not having these discussions. And people get all hurt. People don't like getting involved if people think they're going to get attacked. Why do you want? You know how I beat it. Right? And so some of the best minds when I was in this law school, like Lori, Lori Kuribayashi, did a killer paper, okay, on seated land. I mean, just brilliant paper. And people were like, Lori, Lori, try to go in that direction. She's like, no, I just did the paper and, you know, I can move on. We need a kako. We need everybody to be involved in justice. Okay, that's the bottom line. That's what we're standing for. Critical mass is going to get there because we all have a kuleana of justice here. You don't move away, go away. You get injustice if you go to Arkansas. If you go to Argentina. Your daily life is about justice. Because if not, this law school is not the right place for you. You came to this law school because our legacy and what we carry within our kuubai, our law, is just that. What you do in your daily practice, every day, right, to move forward towards justice. That's what it's about, you know? The dynasty politics, how you going to do, whatever, that's what you deal with. Who you are, and that's, that's internalized stuff. But what it is, and you do every day. So if it's education, it's part of GMO, it's part of protest, it's part of talking to your own family members. Whatever it is, it's got to be a daily practice in, in the direction of justice. You know, because it's not, we just don't all have hurt feelings. Oh, you know what? I remember Lucy Campbell back in that discussion. Oh, you know, Jill, back in the day, she talked about the pre admission program. You said before Hawaiians, and all of a sudden, she talked to people about opening it up for everybody. You know, people want to talk moko, 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 sick, and all that kind of stuff. That's <laughs> crap. And that's what can keep us back. You know, it is really about how we belong in, in that in that arc towards justice. And and we guest here or we host here, whatever you are in it, we all in this together towards justice. That's really the bottom line. You know? And you know what? If you're not sure what to do, learn. You know, we're all internet people now, right? You cannot find this memory of Ahu. If you don't know who Mililani Trap is, if you don't know what anything is about, learn. And then you go over there and you be part of it. 
with pure heart, you like to learn, you like to be part of it, go. You know what? But don't sit back and say, oh, you know, I don't know. I, I, I don't have a place. You get one place. It's called justice. And if you don't do right by the coin, moving forward for justice. That's, that's to me the bottom line. And not only that, it's total. You know what I mean? They're the very ones that know how to be with this aina, this place. And that's the direction. It's called sustainability everywhere else. It's not the Hawaiian way here. That's the bottom line. Come on.
for organizing. People know that things are wrong on so many different levels, but they don't know where to go to do something about that. Uh, but I feel that a tentative invitation has gone out. I've received several invitations to come to public hearings on the PLDC, and I haven't accepted the invitation yet. But that seems to me a very clear uh, way that Hawaiians and non-Hawaiians um, are being asked to take a stand on whether we are going to transfer uh, Hawaiian land to private hands and what the implications of that are. So I think we all need to pay more <coughs> attention to that. But the idea that a call needs to go out, I was, I was really moved by that. Um, I was thinking back uh, to being a young person during the Hawaiian Renaissance learning uh, Kalana Napua and, and learning that in that song there's a call, very specific, naming one by one who is supposed to come. We need you. Um, and that, that tradition of putting out a formal call and you either have to step up or decide you're going to be part of the problem um, and, and leave your mark on history either way. Um, I'm, I too am I'm waiting for I've been waiting a long, long time. So maybe those of us who care about these issues have to think very concretely about what that's going to look like. You know, we're going to plaster this campus with posters saying, you are invited. We need you. This is the call. And this is where you need to be, what time, what place. This is what's going to be asked of you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so we're actually out of time right now. Um, if people want to stay bigger, maybe and ask some questions. But uh, I don't know if we have to go. But thank you so much. Thank you.